Hello and welcome back to the Bird Channel, where we talk about stories and movies, book shows and games, and I stream five days a week on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. Whenever I talk about the elves in the Witcher universe, the Enshe, but primarily the Scoia'tael, I always get a lot of people asking me how I could justify siding with them over the Blue Stripes or the Flaming Rose, you know, against your fellow human. And it's not because I hate Roach or because I hate humanity much. And it's not because I think Jorvath is amazing. Not entirely, anyway. So, why is it? Well, I just think the Squirtel is better written as a faction, and yes, specifically Jorvath, is a well-written character, at least in my eyes. This is going to be a purely personal take, so don't take this as a definitive guide to writing the best characters ever. But let's talk about what makes a good character. Some things we'll talk about will apply strictly to a visual medium, but Certainly not all. Now, gather round the fire and let me tell you a tale. First, let's set the stage. And I will tell you in advance, if you've played The Witcher 1 and 2, then this video will make more sense. Although, I do have two very quick recaps in the description otherwise. For the uninitiated, in the world of The Witcher we find several factions, each opposed to each other. There's Nilfgaard, of course, and Skellige, who raids Nilfgaard on and off. The Northern Realms, who hate Nilfgaard in a very consistent manner, and vice versa. Mages and Witchers, who are hated yet needed by everyone. But there's also the Skoyatel. The Skoyatel are freedom fighters, or terrorists, depending on who you ask. An organization comprised of non-humans. Largely elves and dwarves, but occasionally halflings and the odd helping hand from the Dryads, should they ever enter their domain. Freedom fighters, of course, need a cause, and in this case, it's one of two things. Again, depending on who you ask. Either they want to kill every single human on the planet, or they just want to be left in peace. Are they not being left in peace, then? I hear you ask? Well, no. Unfortunately not. You see, when humanity first set foot on these lands, the elves had shed the warmongering part of their people. They had left for another world altogether. They had made up with the dwarves, who they'd been warring with before, and now they were just having a great time, really. They planned to keep it that way, so when the humans arrived, the elves largely left them to their own devices, until human mages asked for help in learning the ways of magic. The elves agreed to teach them, and not long after that, they were all stabbed in the back. At night. Literally. Not by the human mages in question, but simply by other humans. Humans like land. Elves had land. Humans kill elves. That's the crux of it. The elves kept retreating further and further, losing more of their land each time. Until eventually, the younger elves all threw themselves into battle and died. The elven race was going extinct. Okay, well, our warmongering half left, so... Do you want to be friends? Aye, we can be friends. All right, well, let's go build a road together or whatever. Aye, that's neat. Two hours later. Ah, well, you know what? I could really get used to peace. Oh my god, we just got here and now we can do magic? Oh, you just discovered magic? Good for you! Hey, hey, can you teach me? To use magic? I mean, sure, I guess, why not? Wow, I can do amazing magic now! Thanks! Hey, no worries. Have fun, you rascal! Give me your land! No, ho hold on. We, we just helped you not two seconds ago. I must colonize! So, that's the setting. There's quite a lot more to this, of course, but this isn't a Witcher lore video. We have a whole separate playlist for that. Let's shift our focus to the Scoia'tael I want to talk about most today. Jorveth. If you're a long-time viewer, then you likely already know that I really like Jorveth. He's my favorite Witcher character, and I get asked why often enough. So we're going to mix two subjects at once, using Jorveth as an example of a good character. Again, only to me personally. When we first meet Jorveth in his forest, we've just escaped prison, and Jorveth is introduced to us as the enemy. Not because we're human, we're a Witcher, but because we're hanging out with Roach. And Roach, like various other units across the land, is part of a group that specialized in killing non-humans for a good chunk of his career. We're guilty by association. Jorveth has a few interesting details about him that give away some of his character's story already. A perk of having a visual immediately. He's wearing a bandana to cover up the bloody eye socket that once held an eye. He's a veteran of this human versus elf conflict, and 
clearly earned his stripes. On his belt are several coats of arms collected from other special units like roaches, indicating that he's killed others like roach before. Quite a few, in fact. And he's showing himself to us brazenly, telling us that he's not afraid of us and he's come prepared. In fact, he even tells us so. I like visual storytelling like that. Jorveth doesn't have to tell us any of these things. He's already given us a rough backstory on himself just by showing up. And yes, I'm afraid this plus point only works in a visual medium. Show, don't tell. I'm sure this isn't the first time you've heard that line. The one thing I despise the most in movies or games and so on is endless conversations about the things they should be showing us. Hell, sometimes they do show us, but then they also tell us for some reason. Perhaps because they assume the audience wouldn't understand otherwise. The voiceover in Blade Runner is a very good example of this. The 1982 theatrical release of Blade Runner had Harrison Ford tell us things we really didn't need to hear. Things we could see on the screen, or things we could eventually pick up on through just watching the movie. I don't know why he saved my life. Maybe in those last moments he loved life more than he ever had before. Not just his life. Anybody's life. Shut up! If done well, your characters will never have to directly explain their backstory to you at all. Ever. It will either reveal itself organically or, and hear me out, it just won't appear. Because that's something else I quite like about Jorveth and characters like him. And honestly, this goes for most Witcher characters. He doesn't have a detailed backstory. We hear bits and pieces, of course, how a spear lodged itself in his eye socket and that's how he lost his eye. That he's been fighting for decades and from a Gwent avatar we find out that he used to have beautiful long hair. But that's it. The things we know and learn about Jorveth are current. The type of person he is, his ideals, they are all current. In Vergen, the setting for chapter 2 of the game, we can find him and ask him a bunch of questions, of course, but first of all, you don't have to, and second of all, the questions you ask him are largely about other people, his opinions on various topics, knowledge about the world in general, through which we learn more about him, too. We don't sit down to talk about his childhood, he mostly just stands there and rants about the state of things. Giving every character you write a detailed backstory can very quickly bog things down. If you have to spend all your time explaining where someone came from, there won't be enough time to tell us what they're doing right now. But what if their backstory is really exciting and important? Well, the simplest rule I've heard was to always tell your reader about the most interesting time in your character's life. If their backstory is so important, then write that story instead. Don't make it their backstory, make it the story you're writing right now. Of course, writing out a backstory for yourself is useful, because that way you can weave it into the story without vomiting it all over us in a single stroke. But it should never become a history lesson. Returning to Jorveth, another trait I appreciate in his writing is believability. And there's a few steps to this one. What you're writing can be fictional, of course, but that doesn't mean your characters don't have to make any sense, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't have any rules. Even if said character is supposed to be wacky and silly, they have to be consistently wacky and silly, and if they stop being wacky and silly, give them a reason as to why. Plot holes, depending on the size, can take a reader out of your story pretty quickly, and if your tough hunter suddenly decides to become a stealthy rogue without ever addressing it, that's going to stick out just a bit. They also need to have some sort of motivation in life, a goal, something that guides them. In real life, we often feel like lost souls, no doubt. I certainly have felt that way and still do. But that's why no one should ever write about me. Every character you put into your book has to be interesting, else there's no point in adding them. Following a character's journey to achieve said goal is what makes them interesting. If they just sat at home all day dreaming about chicken soup, then there wouldn't be much of an adventure to be had. Whoa. Jorveth is certainly tough, but there is something of a facade there, too. After meeting him and striking a reluctant alliance with him, you will eventually figure out his motivation. To have a place the elves can call home, and live peacefully, to some extent. The Scoia'tael as a faction are very split in that sense. Yavin from The Witcher 1 wants to kill all the humans and take the elven lands back. Jorveth knows that's unrealistic. 
The elves were never going to win that fight, so he settled for something achievable. You can tell that fighting has broken him somewhat, but as a proud elf, he would never openly show anyone but those closest to him. In this case, Geralt. And Saskia, who he has the world's biggest crush on. I like that Jorveth goes against the grain in that sense. Most Skoyatels settle for simple murder, but Jorveth has a goal in mind, and he works hard to achieve that. When you eventually realize that his dream can never become reality, you feel sad for him. At least I did. Even after compromising so much, in the end, this seemingly simple goal was still unrealistic. Which, juxtaposed with the rest of the rather more bloodthirsty Scoia'tael faction, made it even sadder. It's what made the Scoia'tael more interesting to me, in general, as opposed to, for example, the Flaming Rose, the Witcher 1 faction fighting against the elves. Also because they were very clearly set up to be the villains, of course, but they were simply never really appealing to me in the first place. Outside of their genocidal tendencies, I mean. Miss, do you have a moment to talk about our lord and savior, Jacques d'Aldersburg? Oof, his mother must hate him. Well, he was originally named Alvin, but that doesn't sound very inspiring, just very high-pitched. Anyway, he's going to lead us through the apocalypse safely. There's an apocalypse? Well, there will be. Anyway, can I sign you up? I mean, I, I guess I like living. <laughs> very good. We require a contribution of one child a week and voluntary participation in uh, permanently scarring mutation experiments. What? What? And finally, the most important part is that Jorveth is flawed. Again, this goes for a good chunk, if not all of the Witcher characters. He makes a lot of mistakes. He's duped more than once and yet still convinced that he's always making the right decisions. I wish I had that confidence. He isn't just breathtakingly handsome, extremely good with his words and his bow and a ride or die friend. He's also very capable of doing stupid things. I'm not going to pretend like he's relatable. He's an ancient elf in a fictional world, but he is understandable. The Scoia'tael, including Yoroveth himself, have done some despicable things in the name of freedom. The same things they accuse groups like the Blue Stripes of, the Scoia'tael are equally guilty of. But the point of compelling characters isn't to decide whether you would personally join them, it's to decide whether or not their story is interesting enough to follow, be they good or bad people or something in between. I love Jorveth as a character because from the moment you meet him, he's interesting. There was never a point within the story where I wasn't interested in what he was doing or what he was thinking. And again, this is personal. I'm sure the guy didn't click with everyone and that's okay, but he ticked all of my boxes, as did a lot of Witcher characters. Like Regis, one of my other all-time favorites. Previously, I was a Witcher lore channel exclusively, and there's a reason I was that invested in this series after having read so many books before, after having played so many games prior. There were hardly ever any dull characters. In the books, even the smallest throwaway players were still interesting for the five seconds of page time they were given. In the games, I didn't tire of hearing anyone's voice. The Witcher 2 was my introduction to the Witcher world, and the main reason I stuck around were the characters. And especially in books, it's so important to introduce your characters well. Readers have to actively engage with your work to figure out if they're interested in reading the rest of it. And if your first few pages only ever serve you dreadfully stale character descriptions, then you're not going to keep anyone's attention. A long time ago, I started a book that, by all accounts, should have been right up my alley. Fantasy adventure that actually dropped you right into the action on page one. Our main character was running away from pursuers after a heist, and it was a very cool first page. But then the author paused to tell us what the character's hair looked like, and his clothes, what he was, and how he was, and then they described his cat. Don't get me wrong, I love descriptions of cats, but it was all very dry. We had stopped dead in our tracks to simply deliver some exposition. Even if, after that, your character turns out to be very interesting indeed, you've already lost me. Reading through the whole description would have made Tolkien proud. Except then also sad, because it wasn't even very well written either way. Now you know why I like Jorveth, and also The Witcher. Don't worry, I also like Roach, actually. Now, my dear patrons and Kofi cats, I'm going to put a bunch of Jorveth highlights in the end credits. I'm sure you will forgive me this once. You know how I feel about Jorveth, after all. Thank you. Kofi cats and patron friends for supporting me through my weird channel changes. Of course, you can always support me for free by commenting a whole bunch in the comment section, because 
that's how the YouTube algorithm works these days. And I will see you when another tale finds us. I get it. I don't think so. Do anything stupid and they'll tie you down on an anthill, face coated with honey. You'll scream so loud even the storm riders will hear you. You want to enter a town where they're massacring elves? I take back what I said. You're not grandiose. You're mad. My mother claimed likewise. You're the most noble human I know, Gwynblade. I'm no human. I'm glad you reminded me. My hatred for the species abated for a moment. Or one of the twenty legendary rings of power would be best. One to bring them all and in the darkness bind them. Right. And then I'll have to run barefooted to the top of a volcano. We'll need to hold her down somehow. Hold down a dragon? This is ridiculous! I see you took care of the guards. I hate those monastic curs. They're not paragons of virtue, true. But they were just doing their job. Then they didn't do it well enough. Can we go now? Sooner or later, humans will kill off all the Ensho. All dwarves and gnomes. Then they'll start murdering one another. Your kind knows no other way. It's in your genes. You'll keep killing each other until only one remains. The strongest among you. A thousand years from now, a dim-witted human barbarian will climb to the top of a pile of bones, sit down and proclaim, I win. Prepare to set sail! <laughs>